Well, despite economic data, recession fears are still present in the economy and the market. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell said today at a panel at the European Central Bank that more restricting is coming, driven by a strong labor market. His tendency to stick to this hawkish tone sent stocks lower. According to our next guest, it could be time to get defensive. Joining us now is Samir Saman at Wells Fargo Investment Institute, senior global market strategist. Good to have you back here. So break down your recession projections and what sort of recession we could be looking at. Sure. So we do see a recession in the second half of this year. We think it'll be what's called a moderate one. That'll be enough to solve for the inflationary issues that we're dealing with, but not enough to, you know, kind of push us into the kind of slowdowns that we saw in 08, 09 or 2000, 2002. So what does that mean? That means that at least right now you should be playing defense. That means move into larger cap, higher quality U.S. equities. Um, we like the energy materials and healthcare sectors. We would continue to fade the consumer discretionary and real estate areas. Those are ones that we think in particular will be hard hit by any recession. Um, the other thing is on the fixed income side, we would be locking in those higher longer term yields that we're currently seeing. Um, we also like the short end. There's some good carry there, you know, with rates now close to 5%. We would not be reaching for yield in those lower rated parts of the credit markets right now. And we know there was a lot of talk about the strength of the consumer. And for some things, I mean, housing, they're still willing to spend. We still see a tight labor market. How is that playing into some of the signals that you're keeping an eye on? Sure. So there's kind of what you call leading indicators, right? That's the yield curve. That's some of the PMI data that we've seen. Those are still pretty soft. Then there's kind of the more coincident, the lagging indicators. And those are the more consumer oriented ones. Consumers usually don't stop spending until they start to face job loss or shaky prospects in the labor market. That's not been the case so far. So again, the consumer may yet continue to spend, but again, that's overconfidence on their parts. And then there's the lagging data, right? That's inflation. Inflation is probably going to be one of the last things to come down. So for those that are hoping that inflation will come down quickly and stay down, we think that's probably one of the biggest disconnects between what markets anticipate and what we see. And speaking of that disconnect, I mean, if you look at the VIX, still slightly under 14, I mean, and it does tend to dip naturally in July anyway. But do you think the markets are being too complacent then about the risks ahead? They are. You know, again, seasonality gets pretty rough in that August, September time frame. You also have kind of a lot of the Fed's rate increases working with some lag. Um, as people refinance their auto loans, their home loans, they're forced to pay ever higher rates, right? When you think about what you were paying a year, maybe two years ago, whatever your next loan is, you're going to probably be paying a much higher level. And that sand is going to continue to creep kind of into the gears of the economy. And that's why we see a recession in the second half. That being said, keep in mind that the market peaked almost 18 months ago. And so the market's had quite a bit of a head start to mentally prepare for a recession. So while it may stumble, once the, you know, once the recession actually gets underway, we may not set new lows. It may be more of an economic shoe to drop as opposed to a market shoe to drop. And I mean, we did hear from Powell, more restrictive territory, saying likely two more hikes, a possibility still on the table. And part of that dynamic was sort of taking this pause to assess some of the, the damage, the fallout from the banking crisis. So then I know you're expecting one more hike in July. So do you believe that they'll be done hiking by then? You know, we wouldn't be surprised if they have to keep going. Unfortunately, because of what markets are doing, because of the resilient economic data, right now it's really tough to say that the Fed's job is done. Um, it seems that, you know, things are softening, but then the recent data came out and kind of shows some reacceleration. So, again, I think the Fed's going to remain data dependent. Right now, we anticipate one more. The Fed themselves think maybe two more, um, but their job just isn't done yet. And I think that's one of those things where, we all want this tightening cycle to be over, but I think it's just going to take some time. And you did say you recommend staying defensive at this point. But so how would you allocate your portfolio? And at what point would you be willing to sort of buy into the equity rally? Sure. So we would continue to favor larger cap, higher quality U.S. companies. You know, that's a good way to participate. Funnily enough, that area has actually done the best this year because a lot of the tech companies kind of tend to sit in that catbird seat. So that's our continued play there would be, you know, energy, materials, healthcare alongside large caps. And then on the fixed income side, as I mentioned, you know, we would kind of, you know, take the carry where, where you see it kind of on the short end. We would lock in those longer term yields. We would stay away from credit. And then as far as, you know, kind of where we would see opportunity for us, it's really all about price. So we think the S&P somewhere south of 4,000 probably represents pretty good value. So 3,800, 3,900 would be a pretty good run into our year end target for 2024 of 4,700. 
And what do you think would perhaps make you change your projections here? Any sort of data points that you'll be looking at in the coming months, especially as we see what the Fed does? Sure. If inflation were to shoot down and overshoot the Fed's target of 2% to the downside without a lot of economic pain, that's probably the one scenario that would probably get the markets um, you know, kind of rev back up from the standpoint of this immaculate disinflation. Again, it's not our base case, but that would be one of the upside risks. And I know that you, you focus tend to have a, a focus here on, on fixed income. But of course, you have the AI push that's been lifting a lot of these companies uh, and really helping this rally that we've seen start to broaden out um, among uh, in the broader market here. How much how much weight are you putting on that as people sort of digest how some of these AI uses are actually going to show up for companies and earnings? Yeah, so what we would say is, you know, price is running ahead of expectations. Again, we don't take anything away from AI, it probably is a transformational technology. But when you think back to the late 90s, when, you know, kind of Web 1.0 was in its infancy, you know, a lot of those companies that were initial winners aren't even around anymore. So it's not that the, you know, World Wide Web went away, but a lot of those companies went away. So from that standpoint, you know, again, we think tech should be a neutral weighting within client portfolios. So you can participate in a lot of the technological innovation. That being said, we would not chase the performance in some of these, you know, kind of high flying areas, because again, we just don't know who's going to be the true winner at the end of the day. That's true. As, as you mentioned, their first mover advantage doesn't mean that you have the staying power. A big thank you there to Samir Samana, Wells Fargo Investment Institute, senior global market strategist. Thank you so much.